Ian, thanks for your time. We may no as well worries. start with Absolute Radio, seeing as that's the backing. How was it? You've retired from football. You've done a lot in the game after mm. that. How's the radio going so far? Well, to be honest, the radio is good for me. I didn't really. I only, I only um, discovered it a few years back. I say four, five years ago. I was working on another station, and I didn't. And I realised that you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe because there's no cameras on you, you get to relax more. And you know, because I'm talking football, and you know, I mainly just want to have a laugh when I'm doing it. And you know, it's just something that just suits me. It just suits me. You know what I mean? Of course, we've got this camera on, so people know what I'm dressed like. But so it's like you just wear what you want, and you just say what you want. You know what I mean? You can they can dump stuff if it's not right, <laughs> you know. So it's it's really it's perfect medium for me. And you've done a lot on TV as well, mm. like you say, like football behind bars. You haven't just yeah, done football yeah. though, but it's given you a lot of opportunity to interview some big names as well. Yeah, I remember when I when I first started and I done my um, when I done my when I first done my f my first television show, I done everybody. You know what I mean? Literally, Hollywood a listers and everything. Um, and I think that's why I, m I missed out on the coaching side of it because I went straight from my football career straight into television and I think that kind of hindered me in respect of doing the coaching now like I'm doing with MK Dodds and that but yeah it was it was an unbelievable experience it's, you know I was just able to talk to people that I admired and doing all the television learning where to be and what mark to hit and all that stuff it's something that I wouldn't want to do again now I don't want to do that television stuff again I only want to do now talking about football and doing the radio I've done that now you know what I mean I don't want to do that no more we talk about coaching as well. Mm -hmm. First year with MK Dons, how are you finding it? It's quite tough. You know what I mean? You know, you do stuff um, every day or every other day and you, you wait for it to happen on a Saturday and, you know, you don't see it happening and you don't see the chances taken. You see chances misses and miss, being missed. And you just say, well, Jesus, they're listening or what? what? What's going on? It's, it's, it's not rocket science, you know, just contact in the position when you're in a certain area of the goal, you know, focus on your technique focus on good contact with the ball and sometimes you see people in the box slashing it and slashing at the ball and hurrying and you know what I mean it's quite frustrating being on the sidelines not being able to do anything about that and I think I'm just getting to terms with the fact that I can't do anything about it I've just got to keep trying to get the message over and it's, I find it pretty, pretty hard it's quite time consuming my missus isn't really keen <laughs> on, on the amount of time I'm coming in at two in the morning and stuff like that but can you see it going forward as a coach mm. or a manager no to be honest no I'm working with Carl at the moment and I like working with Carl but I don't know if Carl moved on and that I'd have a problem because at the moment it suits me to do that but I'm doing a lot more commercial stuff now as well um, working for Al Jazeera as well you know I mean that's that's that's, that's pretty good to do and I'm gonna be going over to Qatar and stuff like that so I'm not gonna have as much time but I do like doing it but I don't think I want to be contracted to doing it. I want to be able to go and say, listen, I'll come down this week if you want me to. But I just feel that the fact that I'm um, contracted to do it, it feels a little bit too too much like um, like heart, like work. I don't want it to be work. I want it to be something that I want to do because I want to do it. We have to talk about your career. We spoke before the show about your Nothing to Something documentary. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about Sig Pigden. Sig Pigden was a teacher who literally turned me into a half-decent person when I was a child. He's a main uh, focus in my life in respect of a, a positive ro um, male role model, um, seen as my father left when, we, when I was uh, very young and my stepdad wasn't a very nice bloke. And so he came along and gave me some discipline and some, you know what I mean, taught me uh, to be and taught me to literally read and write properly and all that sort of stuff. He was somebody that was um, a real integral male um, in my life when I needed it. And is that why you, would you pass that on now that you've got that true male <coughs> role model in your life? Well, yeah, you try, you know what I mean? Um, I try to be a positive role, role model for, for for not only my own kids, but for people in general, you know what I mean? You try to be the, a, a proper like male um, in people's lives. I think it's important to have that, you know what I mean? And as I've grown up, and that's why when I met him, when I didn't realise that he was, um, he was alive, it, it, it had such a an effect on me because I didn't realise how much effect that he had on my life and I feel that it's important to try and pass that on. Before you got your chance with Palace, there's a lot of trials that you had as a kid, didn't quite work out. Any reason why? I don't know, you know, at the time I think that what happened is that um, people were looking for bigger kids maybe, you know, some kids are more, uh, they're more developed at certain ages. I was very small from 12 to 15, 16, even 17, I was pretty slight didn't know what kind of body was going to happen, what kind of body was going to fill out. 
And, um, you know, I just kept get re getting rejected, whether I was good enough or not. I could always kick with my left foot and my right foot. I was always pretty quick, but for some reason they just kept saying no. And it got to a point where I couldn't take the rejection anymore. And when I got to in around 19 and I had a trial at Brighton, <coughs> excuse me, I had a trial at Brighton and they rejected me as well. I just thought, well, it's not going to happen. Professional football is too hard to get into um, because if I played as well as I did at Brighton and you don't get in, it's not going to happen. So when Palace came about, I, t I actually turned down the trial. I said to them, um, I can't afford to, to take the trial. I can't afford to have the time off work. And it was only a good, uh, a good foreman, a good boss I had, Gary Twydell, who gave me the time off. Otherwise, I wouldn't have took it. I would have just carried on playing. Sunday morning and maybe semi-pro getting a couple of quid a week for it and that would have that would have done me but you know in the end Palace worked out pretty well and the rest is history they say. Can you believe that you got pulled off Sunday morning pitches and how did you adapt to the professional game once you were at Palace? Well I just feel um, I, I was very nervous about going to Palace thinking are, are you am I going to be good enough but the fitter I got Max the, the, the easier I found it you know what I mean and I worked very very hard um, because like you know like days before I got to Palace, you know what I mean? I was working seven till seven on a building site. So, um, you know, I, I, would, I would just stay there and train as long as I could. And you know what I mean? The more I trained, the, I just, the easier I found it at Palace. And you know, the, the, level, the next level I was going to, next level, next level, I just seemed to, to, to be okay. I think with the pace and the fact that I wanted to score all the time, left and right foot headed, I don't care. I, would, I just think that, you know, Steve, I just came at the right time for Steve Coppel. You got your England call up during that stint mm. at Palace as well, but some will say you didn't have enough caps as maybe you deserved. But mm. you were leading scorer for Arsenal for so many seasons. Yeah. Why was that the case then? I just think that there's sometimes I think there's some opportunities under Graham Taylor that I had that I just didn't take them. And when you're when you're at that level, and you got at that time, you know, you got Shearer, Sheringham, Fowler, Ferdinand, Cole. Um, I don't even know who else. You know what I mean? And myself and. And all those great players vying for two places. And, you know, you get in, it doesn't happen for you. You know what I mean? It, you ain't going to get another chance because other people are waiting for theirs. And what happens is, is that, um, you know, a couple of times I had a couple of opportunities, didn't take them. I think Norway at Wembley was one. I think Russia at, uh, at Wembley was one as well. And then you kind of go back to the back of the queue. But when Glenn Oddle came into the fold, he gave me my chance and I'd proved um, that I was good enough to play at that level. I scored against Italy, scored against South Africa played in a massive game in Rome um, for the World Cup qualifier and it made it made me realise that I had the right opportunity, if I'd taken certain opportunities in respect of goal scoring earlier on, would I have got more caps? Hopefully I would have, but at the end of the day I'm satisfied with the fact that, you know I mean, Glenn Oddle is somebody who I admired, thought I was good enough to play for his England side and he picked me a few times and I proved him right. I have to talk about Arsenal quickly. Um, how special was it when you broke the goal scoring record? Yeah, it was great. You know what I mean? It wasn't one of those records where I think Thierry's put it out of sight now in respect of people trying to catch it. But, you know, my 179 goals from a winger, you know what I mean? And being at Arsenal, being at the record for something like 40 years. Um, so I was pleased in to, to break it. You know what I mean? My name's always going to be up in and around the first uh, one or two or maybe for a, a many, many years to come, hopefully. And at the end of the day, I'm quite happy with that. You know, Thierry's come along, he's going to go down as one of the greatest ever players, and he's broken it, and I don't mind coming in second to him. There's not many people I'd be happy about coming second into, but he's, he's done pretty well, I'd say. So I don't mind Thierry on Reed and Ian Wright. It's fine. I'm, I'm pleased with the way it went. Arsenal's a great football club for me. It's still my life. I still love it. Just like Palace, it will always be my life. But Arsenal is where I had my success. and. You know what I mean? It's always uh, going to be a very special uh, place in my heart. Finally, best moment in football? Um, I suppose I'd, I'd have to say uh, getting getting an England uh, call up and then putting on the shirt against Cameroon. That would have been about as uh, as good as it gets. Cheers, Ian. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Nice one, man.